It's time for Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, inviting the atheist, agnostic, and skeptic to examine for themselves the evidence for the Christian faith. We are all limited by what we do not know and by the things we think we know but are not true. Dr. Joe Mott earned his Ph.D. at LSU and was a distinguished math professor at Florida State University for 38 years, helping to write three math textbooks and authoring over 30 research articles in math. He is now the host of this radio program, Defending and Commending the Faith. Here is Joe Mott. In the last episode, I was discussing William Lane Craig's moral argument for the existence of God. Craig's argument goes like this. Premise one. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. (coughs) Premise two. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Conclusion. Therefore, God exists. I've given some evidence for the truth of premise one in the last episode. I quoted four of the high priests of the religion of atheism, each of which concurs with premise one. These high priests were Frederick Nietzsche, Richard Dawkins, John Gray, and Bertrand Russell. Let me add another quote from the Russian Christian author, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote, If there is no immortality of the soul... There can be no virtue, and therefore everything is permitted. In other words, if there is no God as the foundation of morality, then any behavior is permitted. That is, if God did not exist, then our notions of right and wrong, of good and bad, would be ultimately meaningless. Everything would be permitted because there would be no real objective rules to break. So I believe I have demonstrated that premise one of Craig's moral argument is true. Others may disagree because these five people I quoted could be wrong. Let me give an additional layer of explanation. Note, however, The argument is not meant to imply that people cannot act in a moral way if they don't believe in God. That is not what the argument is about. After all, there are many moral non-believers, and some of them surpass us all in their moral behavior. Instead, a corollary of the argument is that the reason both theists and atheists can have an objective standard of right and wrong, good and bad, is that God exists as the standard itself. Without God, there can be no such thing as objective moral truths. In any discussion of morality, the basic question addressed is, Can humanity be good without the existence of God? When we ask this question, we are posing a question about the nature of moral values, and new questions quickly arise, like, are the values we hold merely social conventions, like driving on the right-hand side of the road, or are they merely expressions of personal preferences, like having a taste for certain foods, ice cream, coffee, etc. Or are they somehow independent of our opinion? And if they are objective in this way, what is their foundation or basis? Scientists have discovered that we actually have more than five senses. When we close our eyes and touch our nose, we are able to know which finger touched our nose. That involves what is called proprioception. We believe that our memories are true, even though our memories can't be accessed by our five senses. Trent Horn reports that psychologist David Eagleman claims that the most important sense we have is our sense of time, 
because if we didn't know how fast time was moving, we would not be able to coordinate our complex bodily actions. But notice that time, memory, and bodily perception cannot be detected by sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. They have to be perceived in a new sense. If there is no God, what then is the basis of morality? In particular, why think of human beings as having moral worth? How does a person ultimately decide what is good or bad, what is moral or immoral? If a person omits a transcendent source of objective moral values, it seems to me that there are at least five options left for a possible source of objective values. A. Science. B. The natural universe. C. Culture or society. D. The individual person. E. Chance or evolution. In terms of option A, can science be the source of objective moral laws, I've shown that the atheists can't offer science as a basis. You can't find moral values in a test tube. And we can't show by the scientific method that the Nazi scientists in the concentration camps in World War II did anything evil. Can science tell the world what contributes to the flourishing of human beings? Yes, in the same way it can tell the world what contributes to the flourishing of an oak tree. But that does not equate to a moral conclusion at all. In terms of B, can the natural universe serve as a source of four objective moral values? I don't see how. How can an unintelligent, amoral, senseless mass of matter give to human beings what it does not have? How can matter create human beings with a sense of moral values, much less convey to them moral values? What about C? Can culture or society be a source of objective morality? This hardly seems possible since in some cultures they love their neighbors and in others they eat them. If the majority rules that rape is good, do you get the majority idea makes it morally good? Morality is not about popularity. We find in the records of past cultures and in present societies that they all have moral laws. It is quite plausible to suppose that all cultures share a certain basic set of core values. The morality defined in the Jewish Ten Commandments, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, the Chinese Tao, and the Christian New Testament all differ in detail and emphasis, but not in essence. For example, some societies allow individuals to kill to avenge a wrong, while others insist that all execution is the prerogative of the state. Some societies allow freedom in premarital sex or permit men to take more than one wife, while others forbid such behavior. But all have rules that say people cannot kill others at will or engage in sex with just anyone they want. These laws generally protect human life. They are rules that govern marriage and family relationships, condemn stealing, and encourage helping others. All cultures, for example, promote truth-telling and caring for children. The reason for this is obvious. A whole culture full of liars is bound to sink into chaos sooner or later. And a culture that does not care for its children will eventually disappear. But despite variations and distortions, the same essential sense of morality appears in all cultures. How can we explain a moral code that is consistently 
present in all societies. What gives every sane person on the earth an innate sense of right and wrong? I think it is because God created us in his image and placed within all of us a conscience according to Romans 2 verses 14 and 15. So we have something innately within us that gives us a hint to what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, and worthy of praise. This commonality points to God as the source of morality. Option D is the individual. If there is no transcendental moral lawgiver, then every individual is left to his own opinions of morality. But this is clearly overwhelmed by self-interest. If two people disagree, their self-interests enter into the situation and the resolution is not very likely to happen. One person's viewpoint is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. In that case, it's like a personal preference of, say, strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not in the object. Subjective morality, like a personal preference, applies to the subject only. It is not binding on anyone else. Option E, chance or evolution. If we say moral values and duties have their origin in chance, as in evolution, then morality is a random trick of nature to get us to be obedient to some random law. How can obedience help us to flourish and to survive? Without appeal to a higher authority, namely God, what could account for the moral sense that is common to the entire human race throughout all of history? Where else could moral laws come from? So it makes sense to me that these five options for a source of moral values and duties fail. If these are all the options, then that takes us back to the transcendent God as source of these moral values and duties. Thus, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Now we've demonstrated the truth of premise one of Craig's moral argument. Let's turn to demonstrating the truth of premise two, that objective moral values and duties do exist. I'll make this claim. There is a universal objective moral law. Why? Allow me to list some reasons. First, I know of no one who denies that moral laws exist. Almost everyone agrees that torturing babies for the fun of it is terribly wrong, or that starving the poor is wicked, or human trafficking, slavery, and harvesting organs are depraved behaviors, or that sexual abuse is wrong, or that racial discrimination is unfair, or that terrorism is praiseworthy. Second, this moral law cannot be part of the natural world. This seems obvious to me. A moral law is a notion, an idea, and ideas exist only in minds. A law has no meaning unless it comes from a mind. Thoughts depend on thinkers. But since the natural world has no mind, and the law exists in a mind beyond the natural world, it makes sense that this mind is supernatural. Third, if there is a moral law, then we must posit a moral law giver. Anyone who is troubled by evil in the world will have to agree that if evil exists, then there is also good and therefore there must be a law by which evil and good are distinguished. This implies there is a moral law and thus a moral law giver. Ultimately, this moral law giver can be shown to be God. 
Friedrich Nietzsche declared that God is dead. But he also warned that when one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right of Christian morality out from under one's feet. By breaking one main concept out from the Christian worldview, that is, faith in God, one breaks the whole system. In the next episode, I will continue the proof of Craig's moral argument. In the meantime, exercise daily, walk with God. Thank you for listening to Defending and Commending the Faith with Joe Mott, a production of Wave 94 Radio in Tallahassee, Florida. If you have any questions or comments for Joe, please forward them to Doug Apple at Wave 94 at this email address, dougapple at wave94.com. And be sure to join us every Monday evening at 6.45 p.m. on Wave 94 and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, Defending and Commending the Faith, with Joe Mott.